So uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you, to our free speakers that you are going to, to meet and see today. So, okay. Um, Today is uh, the second part of a lecture series which we started in January, which is called Reading Russian Philosophy in the Age of Putin. Uh, so we had our first part in January, we have the second part now, and the third part will be uh, in uh, June. So uh, today we'll have two lectures but by our two speakers. Uh, I'll present, first of all, Professor Ivan Folletti. Before that, though, I'd like to just say a few words about the concept of this joint lecture, how two people who actually work on completely different periods, different material and all that, were brought together. So the concept is, uh, what I called visual thought. Now, uh, you know, it's always very suspicious when people start citing themselves, but it's not completely me. It's actually an idea that I borrowed from Pavel Florensky, a religious philosopher from the beginning of the 20th century. And among many other things he did, like he wrote theology, philosophy, uh, he wrote on the visual arts and so on. At one point in his life, he also wrote uh, poetry. Uh, and in the last years of his life, when he was in one of the Stalinist camps, he wrote a poem which was called Oro. Uh, Oro is about uh, a boy from a Siberian tribe. And what makes Oro special is that he thinks not through concepts, but through images. So therefore, visual thought. And I think that, you know, the way I understand visual thought is that, uh, you know, this is a way of conceptualizing theological, religious, political, cultural ideas through visual categories, like image, icon, perspective, and so on. Uh, I think there are also different ways of showing how visuality plays in you know, in a relationship with ideas. And I think this is what our two speakers will do today. And so we'll start with Ivan Folletti, who is a full professor in art history at Masaryk University in Brno in the Czech Republic, uh, where he's also the head of the Center for Early Medieval Studies. He's also the privat docent at uh, a private docent at the University of Helsinki. Now, Ivan is someone that I was very happy to meet in person for the first time in my life today because I've been trying to get him for some time. Uh, and he always disappears somehow. We had a conference on Byzantium and the origins of Eurasia at the Institute a few years ago with several other fellows at the Institute. Uh, Valentina Izmirleva was there, Alexei Lidov, these old people you might have uh, actually uh, met. There was also uh, Sergei Ivanov, the famous Byzantine historian. And so Ivan could only participate uh, online. So today I was very happy that he actually he could come here in person. Uh, now I'll just go very quickly through some of his publications and so on, just to give you an idea of his background, which is important in a way to see uh, you know, where the two speakers come from in a joint lecture. So his PhD is from the University of Lausanne, and he specializes in Byzantine studies, the art of Italy, and the Caucasus in, the, in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. He's directed several uh, research projects on um, a topic that he's been working on quite a lot, the impact of migrations on art in the medieval Mediterranean world. Like for example, one of his projects which he directed and worked on with several other people is called Migrating Art Historians on the Sacred Ways. It came out as a book in 2018. He's the author of four books, including one he co-authored with uh, Adrian Palladino called Byzantium or Democracy. Kondakov's legacy in immigration. This came out in 2020. He's held many fellowships. Um, 
I'll just mention two, the Max Planck Institute for Art History, the Deutsche Forum in Paris, and many others. And he's been the invited lecturer in, all over Europe, Bolo Bologna, Freiburg, Naples, Prague, and so on. So I'll now give the floor to Ivan. Clemena, um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here as well in person. It, I'm not exactly disappearing person, but we were enough lucky to meet each other several times. And so um, finally in person and happy to be there and honored to be there. So thank you for much to, to, so much for the invitation. We received a very strict task, which is that Misha and I should speak for 25 minutes each. So I'm now stunting my counter to don't overpass these 25 minutes, which will be obviously hard because as you can see from my title, I was pretty optimistic in promising something, going from Nicholas I to Vladimir Vladimirovich. That means a long uh, time. I will try to do so uh, dancing between small stars, let's say so, uh, with few important elements. But we can say that my starting point is this building. Uh, as you can see, this is a neo-neo-Russian building. For those who are familiar with it, it's uh, the temple of the four armed forces of the Russian Federation, which has been open in 2020, so uh, during full COVID, and actually mm, the building in Russian milieu was pretty discussed for several reasons. One of them because apparently among the images was supposed to appear also the face of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, because the main iconographic idea of the building was the one of creating a visual story of all Russian winners all through history, starting with Alexander Nevsky and going up to the conquest of Crimea in 2014. So the visual idea was to just put out uh, these great winners. Finally, Putin's poetry disappeared. We are not pretty aware why this did happen. Maybe a pretending pro Kremlin media because he was too humble. Still, when the building was inaugurated, and you can see the patriarch Kirill Putin and the ministry, minister of, of arms, of, of the army, um, Shogun, which are walking through the building, you can actually see something which is visible from the language of their bodies. The performative event of the president walking through the building, behaving as a true Hazyain. I mean, he is the boss, the boss of this building. And I think this is pretty inspiring for several reasons, because on the one side, this is showing us clearly something which we are assisting not only in the last decade, which is this complete merging between throne and altar, when the president and the patriarch are becoming fellows in criminal organization. At the same time, uh, this building, however, and this is for me as an art historian very telling, can be actually seen as a reinterpretation maybe of two very famous 19th century buildings. On the one side, the Temple of Christ the Savior, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow, and the other is this lovely church built in St. Petersburg in order to honor the death of Alexander III in 1881. So, with all evidence, the architect responsible for this building, which is, by the way, a pretty mediocre architect, um, wanted to show the continuity between 2020 and these two churches, which are true icons of official Russian representation 19th century. And I would say this is maybe the beginning of my thinking today, because I would like to go with you through three steps, which can maybe explain how we arrived to this, starting from there. So, my structure is pretty simple. I will start with um, reminding few elements of how Russian imperialism affirmed itself in the 19th century, so from Napoleon to Russian imperialism and Byzantium, and how does the medieval heritage play a key role in constructing Russian identity in the 19th century. Um, I'm speaking about Russian, by the way, I would like to precise Russian imperial or the identity of the empire, because you are speaking at that point of a multi-ethnical and multicultural empire. And while this will not be the main line of my thinking, I would like all of us to be aware of this, that we are using a term which today is connotated in a national way, but which meant in 19th century something completely different than the modern European nation. The second step will brought us directly to the mid of the 20th century with Hitler, Stalin and the blood of liberators as pretext for imperialism. I will try to very briefly outline 
The question of to which extent the Second World War is one of the key moments in reconstructing Russian imperial policy, but what is interesting for me as well is to which extent material and visual culture are following and accompanying this process. And um, as you can see, my last point, Lushkov Putin and the dream of the return of the Russian Empire is obviously linked to present days, the last 30 years, and uh, once more what will be uniting all these points will be obviously material and visual culture. However, Architecture and images are something crucial for me as an art historian, but the two other keywords which will be walking with us all around this lecture will be obviously religion, namely Russian Orthodoxy, and um, to a certain extent we can also say that the central core idea will be the one on colonialism slash imperialism, because this is something we'll be unable to really switch from. So let's directly run to this first part. And we can start with this image, which apparently is a random one. Mm, for a viewer who is not familiar with, it's not evident if you are building or destroying here a church. This is indeed a destruction. And Destroying a church is, in general, pretty astonishing as an element. But if I will tell you that this church is destroyed in Warsaw, Catholic, Poland, in the early 20th century, after World War I, this is even more shocking. Why Polish can be destroying a church in the middle of the city of Warsaw? And obviously, we will hopefully, at the end of this part, reach the answer why. But I would like just to start with this moment. We are in 1920. One, and we are destroying a church in the heart of Warsaw. And I can anticipate that this church was consecrated to a certain Alexander Nevsky. Um, I mean, if I will be really trying to be caricatural, I would say that 19th century reflection on uh, what is the place of Russia within the big story of the time maybe can start with one of the images representing Napoleon in Russia. You all know the story which is constructed around the dream of this co cohabitation east-west, then Napoleon arriving to Moscow, burning the city. We all know the stories Tolstoy wrote about this Napoleon coming in, 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 in Russia. But if we go a bit further in the story, we will see that this strange clash between the Western visual culture and the search of an imperial Russian language is pretty interesting, especially when Napoleon is defeated. Because um, something is happening in the history of the architecture as reaction to Napoleon arriving to Russia. And we can trace it when actually looking to the church I've already shown you, which is the Church of Christ the Savior in Moscow. Um, what you see now down is the first project of this church. It's been built just after the Napoleonic Wars. And the church was supposed to be looking like a neoclassical building. Um, the very idea was to celebrate the victory of Napoleon, but doing it in a language, I would say, very close to French Pantheon. So we will be celebrating the victory over Napoleon with, I would say, French weapons. Then things did change. Uh, we have obviously Decabrist coup d'etat, which did not work, unfortunately, in 25, And we have the new emperor, um, Ale, who is a pretty, pretty complex person. We don't have the time to speak about Nicholas I. But one of the things which his empire or power was characterized by was a conscious reflection about how we present the empire within visual and material culture. As a result, the Church of Alexander Ton, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior is called to be the exact or almost exact copy of the Hagia Sophia of Justinian in Constantinople, which is this not at all. This is a kind of very interesting neo-Russian style. Still, Nicholas II, I'm sorry, accompanied with Sergei Uvarov, conceived the idea of this style becoming the official style of the empire. And this is becoming a law. So we have one official style, which is supposed to represent both the medieval heritage of Russian culture and its imperial descendants from Byzantium. This is the reason why they were referring to Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. So a church which is supposed to become the visualization of a concept. We are an empire and this empire is coming down from Byzantium. Now, what is really interesting when looking to the material visual culture is that in the following years, while discovering how Byzantine architecture was look, really looking like, and this was the task of scholars mainly, um, 
the visual culture and architecture of the empire was more and more represented by buildings, which were taking inspiration from Constantinople. I will show two of them just to let you understand the idea, but there were much more of them. On the one side, you see the church consecrated to Alexander Nevsky in the Tbilisi and built up to celebrate the final victory over Southern Caucasus. On the other side, you see Alexander Nevsky Cathedral in Bulgaria, in Sofia. This is in Clemena's honor, obviously. obviously. In the middle, we have one of the potential models, a mid-Byzantine church from the early 12th century Constantinople. What is the point is that, with all evidence, the official national style conceived under tone was updated in order to promote a Russian visual policy through building of visual elements, which were both representing the idea of an empire, Byzantium, and using and referring at the same time at the Russian medieval history, Alexander Nevsky. So, elements which are showing the constellation of power. Now, at a certain point of the late 19th century, this was totally common. All European powers, colonial and imperialist, were behaving so. Still, I would say that the Russian way of doing it was pretty refined, because on th they were combining visual elements with scholarship, which was trying to emphasize the unicity of the Russian heritage. And at the same time, like, for example, the case of the writing of Nikarim Kandakov on Armenia and Georgia, trying to prove that all the other states under the Duke of the Empire were always being provincial. So the very idea was to show that the Russian imperial heritage is not only constructed on generic power coming from Byzantium, but th that this is justified by what was Byzantium and what was the power of Byzantium, and thus scholarship, art, and brutal politics were coexisting together in promoting and building the image of an empire which is constructing its own identity on visual culture. The big building you see there is the Alexander Nevsky Cathedral of Warsaw. You are starting with this first part. Because this became one of the monuments which was constructed after the uprising of Poland in 1863. It is told, and I am pretty convinced this is true, that before this date, the empire was not totally aware of what does mean a nationalism. But the Polish uprising was a shock for the emperor of the time, which was Alexander II. As a reaction, obviously, the empire used the most strong nationalistic, no, imperialistic, I'm sorry, power, russifying brutally Poland. And to show the final victory, this church was constructed. This was in neo Russian style, obviously, and it was the highest building of Warsaw. Imperial policy, architecture, the holy Ni Alexander Nevsky, a perfect triangle. And now we are not surprised why, as one of the first things Polish did when liberated from the empire was to destroy this church. So the roots of 19th century Russian imperialism are an integrally mental construction, which is putting together orthodoxy with architectural layout, and which are trying to unite these two points with the Byzantine heritage, which is supposed to justify any sort of imperial ambitions, being them real or not. But scholarship and science serving the empire can be good tools to actually promote the vision of the world. So these are, in a way, the origins of why neo-medieval visual styles are integrative part of Russian cultural identity. And we are jumping to the moment two. Um, the names you see, Hitler, Stalin and the blood, are obviously all referring to World War II. But we can maybe start with another destruction of church. This time is the explosion. It did happen in 1932, in the morning. And the explosion was pretty intense because you are on the heart of Moscow. I'm pretty sure no one was asking what is happening. Because it's not good in 32 to be asking what is happening when you hear explosions in the morning. However, this is the church of Christ the Savior. It's the cathedral we have seen built in honor of the victory over Napoleon, which is destroyed. It's destroyed in order to um, show that the new power is cutting down the story. No continuation anymore in the past. And in theory, no imperialism. We are building a multinational, multicultural state, which is the Soviet Union. By the way, international, as communists will be internationalist. And um, so apparently, 
The past should not exist anymore. Um, we don't have the time to speak about how the 20s are different from the 30s in the Soviet national policy, which would be crucial to understanding what we are speaking about. But it's true that whatever was medieval in the 20s, and especially 30s, was suspect and eliminated. From art historian, which were executed or sent in the camps, to buildings and objects destroyed in a more or less systematic way. Things are, however, changing at the end of the 30s. And we all know this wonderful image uh, from Einstein's Alexander Nevsky. We all know as well that this movie has been screened in 1941 in order to boost the national or imperial feeling against the Nazi Germany during the occupation. What not so many people know is that the movie was ready to be produced already in 1938. And then after he built up Molotov's pact, it was like put in the treasury for a while before becoming actual this moment. Um, Alexander Nevsky is definitely a nationalist and anti-German movement, um, which is how are they, however, I'm sorry, taking back at least two important elements, one of them being Middle Ages and a saint, Alexander Nevsky. So religion and Middle Ages are back in the discourse. And according to some scholars, we can speak about Alexander Nevsky becoming a pop icon through this movie. So things are apparently changing, and it is hard to understand to which extent this is simple, like rational decision from the side of Stalin, or if the game was more complex. But as a possible reaction towards the national slash whatever of the Nazi Germany, Alexander Nevsky and the heritage he is linked with is becoming interesting for the new situation in the Kremlin. What is also interesting to add is that when the war starts, the orthodoxy will be supporting the regime, as we all know, and uh, this will lead to one of the most impressive events of the war, even if none so many persons have heard about at the moment it was happening. Stalin, at a certain point, invites the leaders of the Orthodox Church to join him in the Kremlin. And people are thinking they will be killed, right? I mean, if you are picked up in the middle of the night to go somewhere being a bishop of Orthodox Church in 43, this is not a good sign. And very contrary, Stalin is actually ordering him to elect a new patriarch after centuries, I'm mean sorry, de de decades. And um, even more, he's deciding to give money and a certain independence to the Orthodox Church. Now, um, the story has been studied in many, many perspectives, all of them, I would say, interesting. Um, people arguing that this was under the pressure of Anglo-Saxon or UK-US word because they needed to have more freedom for religion in the Soviet Union if supporting the war. Um, other were thinking that Stalin had the first moment of generosity, thinking, oh, Orthodox Church is supporting us, let's support Orthodox Church. And Alessa, um, Adriano Roccucci recently wrote a very nice paper about it, thinking that Stalin was never hearing no one and has never been generous in his li life. So it would be strange Stalin becoming suddenly a generous man. But uh, more plausibly, and this is something which is impressive and it's visible in a way in this, by the way, very modern drawing, is that Stalin in 1943 was already aware of the fact that they will win the war and very likely he will receive part of Europe. So even before actually Yalta's agreement, he was aware that Romania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Poland will return in the sphere of influence of the empire. And he was very likely thinking to use orthodoxy as one of the weapons to promote Russian Soviet in this way imperialism. What is also tricky is that on the one side, the Orthodox Church received the role, a very important role in the Russian war. Secondly, that after decades of problematic interactions, medieval studies and art became something again important. And we can say that this was not limited only to theory, because one of the most impressive moments of the war was the first speech of Stalin in 1941. During this speech, this voice, which is, I mean, in all Soviet imaginary, coming from these amplifones, speaking to brothers and sisters, so very Christian language, right? Well, Stalin is actually reminding all the heroes, starting with Dmitry Donsky and Alexander Nevsky, obviously. What is super tricky, that at Komsomolskaya, one of the stations of Mitrov Moscow, in 1951, is executed an entire ceiling in golden mosaic. There is nothing more Byzantine than mosaic, right? And if you look to the iconographies, you see all the winners of all Russian wars. Is this reminding you something? The Putin's project, all the winners, 
Stalinian project. And at the very heart of it, you see Alexander Nevsky holding in his hand a Veronica. Nothing more Christian and Byzantine than an imago of the Mandilion and or Veronica. So, while this sounds very strange, we can say that visual culture belonging to Byzantine and medieval past, techniques coming from the same past, and notions and ideas from the same period are reused during Stalinian era. This is not true for architecture, because starting from the project of the never realized Palace of the Soviets and going through the Seven Sisters, these enormous skyscrapers dominating Moscow, this has nothing to do with neo-medieval language, but if you look at the way in which these buildings are settled all around Europe, in all the countries which have been conquered or became part of the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union, we can maybe observe a very similar way of colonizing the space, the public space, as it has been done in the 19th century with the churches of Alexander Nevsky. So, this continuity and a surprising and unexpected continuity. We don't have the time to speak about what will happen in the 50s and 60s, which is so interesting, but we should jump out to the 90s. So, we have this moment of clash. We all know it, 1991, Gorbachev arriving, standing up, and just a few days after having said, Soyuz Budget, we will have the union, no union anymore. 15, 500 days to passing from capitalism, from communism to capitalism. Explosion of the empire directed by the Chicago boys. I mean, we have many things which are really fascinating in this period. We can't speak about that, but we can return to the church of Christ the Savior. Because yes, this is the red line guiding all my speech. And this is reconstructed from 1995 on. The idea was there already during Perestroika. They even started to collect from down money to build a small chapel in memory of this incredible building. Finally, Lushkov, one of the most impressive figures of the 90s, right? The mayor of Moscow, who made peace in the city. Well, Pax Lushkoviana was a very specific kind of peace in close interaction with mafia and other similar structure, is deciding to build this building. We don't have the time to discuss all the reactions this created, because all dissidents and obviously uh, part of the intelligentsia was totally shocked by this ambitious, extremely apparently luxurious building, which was even provoking in the ears of the most tragical economical tragedies happening in Russia. I mean, these splendid photographs are from Dana Kindrova, one of very talented Czech photographers, who was in this year in Moscow, and those who have been in the 90s remember what was Moscow in the 90s. Many people without food, staying in the streets, and at the same time, everything was possible in Moscow. So people going all around with flags of Soviet Union, side by side with people running with all Nazi possible symbols. In this terrible chaos, and uh, with the mafiosi structures receiving power, a church is built. And this church is supposed, in the words of Yeltsin, who is one of the figures playing around this church together with Lushkov, become the sign of the new heritage of the country, reconnecting with the past. This is the facade, however, for those who have been down under the cathedral, apart parking and a big market center, there is a series of things which have nothing to do with religion at all. So the mafiosa part of the project is visible even its, in its true identity. Nevertheless, and this is for me the most crucial point, is that the union between throne and altar became something tangible in the Russia of the 90s again. Vazrajdini Hramov, Vazrajdini Rasi. The renaissance of churches is the renaissance of Russia. And this is something which became even stronger in the year of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. We have him again with Kirill and Pravoslavni za Putina, no doubt. The Orthodox are standing with Putin. It is maybe not by accident that this is precisely in this church that in 2012 the Pussy Riot performed the legendary prayer, one of the most, I would say, Orthodox prayer in the last years. Bogorodica Dieva Vigani Putina. It means Our Lady Mother send away Putin and the Patriarch Kirill. Uh, we know as well that these four ladies were then under trial and two of them finished for two years in prisons, while mother of so small kids. Um, all the theory about why they should be arrested was because not paying respect to a church, 
meaning be offending both orthodoxy and the Russian Empire. Um, 2012 is, however, a critical year for another reason. This is the year when Putin is re-elected for his third or fourth term after the Medvedev's break. And we know as well that millions of people were in the streets against what was happening in 2012. Uh, the repression was brutal. And uh, what I believe should be remembered as well is that this repression had shown to which extent the regime is weak. The Putin's regime was weak because the country was in a mess. Money was arriving because of the selling all around the world, the richnesses of the country, but uh, corruption, dysfunctions, and really ethical problems were at the heart of what was happening. And uh, now, I believe that the very center of this problem was a try to cover what is actually happening. This try was using exactly the same weapons which Russian propaganda had used for centuries. It means returning back to the Byzantine heritage and to justify with orthodoxy, autocracy and a sort of nation the Putinian regime. Aggressivity and external problems are the necessi necessarily following step, which did occur in 8, 14 and 22. And um, what is for me tricky, and this is my conclusion actually, is that more the time was going on and more the facade is empty. In Russia, there are very little of people being orthodox, but orthodoxy and the visual pre-modern culture, or pretended so, are presented as being identity element. This is something which is not true for anyone, but even less today than ever before. And um, I would just be reading the visual representation of Putin's regime as the last step in a more empty and empty use of a Potemkin village in no Byzantine coulisse. You use a certain very superficial and random past to justify who you are, an empire. And uh, I will just be standing with her, as in 1212 when this photo was shooten. I'm waiting for changing. Thank you so much. Basically, as we did the previous time, we'll have our second speaker give his talk, and then we'll collect questions for both speakers together. As some people may have actually a question that refers to both. Okay, Misha, please. Um, Keep it short. So, uh, I would like to very shortly present uh, our next speaker. Uh, some of you know him quite well. Misha Gabovitz is um, a fellow at our institute at DVM. He also holds a fellowship at the Research Center for the History of Transformations at the University of Vienna. Uh, he did his BA and MA at Oxford and his PhD in Paris. His field of specialization, which is something that his talk now also belongs to, is a war memorials and war commemoration. Uh, he's held fellowships at uh, various institutions, including the Einstein Summer House in Germany, at Princeton, at the Madrid Institute for Advanced Studies. He's taught uh, in many places in Europe and America, Princeton, the Humboldt University in Berlin, in Frankfurt, and so on. Now, Misha has published six books in different languages. Uh, I'll, I'd like to just cite two of them because I think they relate to uh, what he'll be talking about today. So in 2016, his, uh, his book, Protest in Putin's Russia, came out. And 2017, Replicating Atonement, Foreign Models in the Commemoration of Atrocities. 
Uh, with Anna Topolska, he's now co-editing a special journal issue which is called Beyond Representation, Visual Analysis of History Textbooks and Other Educational Media, which is something you'll hear about more uh, now. So, Misha, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Clemena. Three disclaimers. Uh, first of all, I will not be able to match Ivan's passion. <laughs> Secondly, I'm not going to talk about Russian philosophy in that I'm not talking about philosophy and Russia is in fact underrepresented in my sample for this project. And thirdly, uh, I apologize, my presentation for complicated technical reasons is in PDF format, so the captions will be difficult to read sometimes. So I feel completely disqualified from talking about visuality and, and Russian philosophy. But if you're staying, it's your own fault. Uh, the study I'm going to uh, present today grew out of observations made in the course of ethnographic research on post-Soviet commemorative practices. Encounters with war memorials today are often structured in the form of pedagogical projects that aim to secure the intergenerational transmission, not only of a certain narrative about history, but perhaps just as importantly, of a strong emotional connection to monuments as commemorative sites. And the best known example, which you can see here, is the giant uh, Treptow Park Mem War Memorial in Berlin. The silhouette of its central statue a soldier holding a rescued child, became ubiquitous in Soviet textbooks and other print and three-dimensional media, and remains so today. And one of the main reactions that I have observed during a decade of fieldwork at the memorial, during commemorative events attended by people with Soviet roots, was a highly emotional recognition effect. Right? Um, based on the idea expressed numerous times in interviews conducted at the memorial, I have seen this so many times, and now I get to be here. Right? So there's um, a recognition of something that already feels intimately familiar, even though this is the first time that you're actually physically at the site. So depictions of war memorials abound in Soviet and post-Soviet educational media. And indeed, such uses were sometimes explicitly anticipated during the monument's design phase when architects debated how to design a monument in such a way that it would look impressive when depicted in a textbook. And these observations, I believe, can serve as a useful corrective to a tendency in memory studies, public history, other fields, that reduces our relationship with the past to a narrative. Right? From that perspective, pictures become visual narratives, and commemorative practices are examined primarily as pillars of certain narratives. And this narrative-centered approach has uh, also informed the vast majority of the numerous studies of Soviet and post-Soviet history textbooks that have appeared in recent years, which almost invariably offer close textual readings of a small number of textbooks. So this is how textbooks, textbook X or Y talks about the Second World War, the 19th century, etc. But unlike other visuals, which in Soviet propaganda were often accompanied by discursive or performative slogans, right? Lenin lives, forward to communism, pictures of war memorials were almost invariably shown uncommented and continue to be so today. With few exceptions, they are not themselves subject to discursive exercises. And their function thus is to be contemplated or simply absorbed rather than to act as objects of a body of positive knowledge that is instilled in pupils. So the role of pictures, I would argue, is to familiarize pupils with a certain visual canon and make sure that everyone develops a strong emotional connection with those pictures. And this, I would argue, is the basis for many sensitive responses to real or perceived threats to monuments. Those who oppose their destruction or removal often do so, not primarily on the grounds of disagreement over an historical interpretation or a set of values, but because they sense a threat to something that they are, for a variety of reasons, profoundly attached to. And conversely, those proposing or engaging in iconoclasm usually lack this familiarity altogether or else have a negative personal attachment, experiencing a memorial as a threat. So I'm going to mostly skip over my research design and the data set. Just very briefly, um, I spent several months at the 
library of the Georg Eckert Institute in Braunschweig, Brunswick, in Germany, which has the world's largest collection of uh, textbooks in history and the social sciences from all over the world. And I also supplemented my uh, database with uh, textbooks from the National Library uh, of Russia in St. Petersburg. And overall, I looked through over 2,000 textbooks, and particularly my sample includes four, exactly 450 relevant Soviet and post-Soviet textbooks in 18 different languages, published between 1945 and 2019 uh, in the Soviet Union and 11 out of its 15 successor states uh, that have chapters covering the Second World War and or what is called in the Soviet tradition the Great Patriotic War, from 1941, uh, the Nazi attack on the Soviet Union, until 1945. So I looked through these chapters and I noted a number of variables such as chapter length as a proportion of the total number of pages, but in particular I looked at the visual elements and I identified every single image of a war memorial uh, that can be found in the relevant chapters and I also looked at the post-war chapters for pictures of war memorials. So I'll be happy to, to talk more about the, um, the sample and the database later, but um, based on the images that I have seen, I would argue that pictures of war memorials in Soviet educational practice were used for two different types of familiarization. One was based on the frequent repetition of simplified shapes, creating a recognition effect. And that's what we have with the trip to a soldier. And the other was premised on contextualization and intimate knowledge, acting as a vehicle for a Sovietized local identity. And I will show you examples of both. So from the Stalin era until the demise of the Soviet Union, uh, history education in uh, Soviet schools relied primarily on single, standardized, and universal textbooks that were regularly updated and were supposed to be used across the entire country, either in Russian or in translation. After 1945, the Great Patriotic War was discussed in introductory manuals for the fourth year, and again in the textbook on recent Soviet history for the final year of secondary uh, school, usually year 10, and then was supplemented from the late 1950s with a separate textbook on international history that covered the Second World War. And the book's visual component remained limited at first. Illustrations in final year textbooks changed little across the late Stalinist and Khrushchev periods. Maps of attack routes with a primary type of visual reflecting a top-down view of the war that privileged the Kremlin's perspective and left no place for the experiences of common soldiers. Under Khrushchev, the maps were supplemented with photos of tanks and occasional reproductions of paintings showing battle scenes and other defining moments of the war. The transition from the Khrushchev to the Brezhnev period uh, was accompanied by a significant increase in the visual component of textbooks. This increase also coincided with uh, much more centralized programs of war commemoration in the anniversary year of 1965, expanding a set of practices that had been particularly widespread in the western regions of the Soviet Union, into a nationwide cult. Uh, taken together, this led to the appearance of pictures of great patriotic war memorials in history textbooks published in Moscow from 1965. Uh, they were prominently placed, often featuring on the book covers, and the Treptow soldier in particular was shown, for example, on the cover of the Atlas of the Contemporary History of Foreign Countries, starting with the 1967 edition. Here you find an edition from 1990 where it's still seen. And it was also the central visual of uh, various editions of the 1980s textbook on recent world history. So, world history, history of foreign countries, symbolized by the Treptow Park soldier. Um, it was also shown in the first picture of a great patriotic war memorial to appear in a regular union-wide history textbook, which you can see here. And even though it was a photographic image, it bore a marked resemblance to the drawings published earlier in newspapers and military manuals, exhibiting two features, and I do apologize, the small caption, exhibiting two features that would prove to have a lasting influence. The first feature was a visually decontextualized presentation. So the statue, let's return to this one, with part of its pedestal was shown against a white background with none of the surrounding area or any visitors visible. Of course, this technique was not new. It echoed drawings of monuments in 19th century European textbooks. And in the case of the uh, Trepto uh, soldier, the silhouette of the soldier had become a staple of Soviet newspaper publications well before the mid-1960s. As a result of this kind of repetition across different media, um, 
the picture became familiar in the sense of being instantly recognizable and began to appear timeless. The historian Carlo Ginzburg coined the notion of feed de sens to denote traces of polyphony in authoritative archival documents. And the visual historian Sylvie Lindeperc has suggested that this term could be applied uh, in order to describe elements of an image that may have escaped the attention of the camera operator or photographer capturing it, but become relevant to later viewers. The technique of cutting out the background of what was being depicted sought to suppress such uncontrollable elements, directing the viewer's gaze squarely to the object presented and almost placing it outside time and space, giving it the eternal quality that late Stalinism claimed for architecture. Some of you are familiar with Antony Kalashnikov's book about this, and which came to be associated with the entire Soviet project by the Brezhnev period. Regarding monuments, this technique was used primarily for those located in East Central Europe, inaccessible to most Soviet citizens and symbolizing eternal gratitude, in contrast with monuments inside the Soviet Union, which the textbooks tended to domesticate by presenting them in context which I will discuss later. This made pictures of such monuments special in one respect. Unlike other well-known images, they became truly iconic in the literal sense, on which Clemena has written at least two books, of pointing to a transcendent reality devoid of any additions that might lend themselves to alternative interpretations. The second feature was that pictures of monuments built in the post-war era were almost invariably used anachronistically to illustrate events of the war, rather than the period of their construction. In the 1965 uh, primary school reader, and in all its subsequent appearances in textbooks, the soldier statue from Trepto accompanied a chapter about the liberating role of the Red Army, rather than about post-war East Germany. And uh, let me remind you that the memorial complex with the statue was opened in 1949, so four years after the end of the war. Associating any monument with the period when it was built was generally a rare practice in Soviet history textbooks. For war memorials, it was almost unheard of, with very few exceptions. Such types of presentation erase any distinction between a monument and the time period that it refers to, implicitly turning any attack on a monument into an attack on a revered period of history. This holds especially true of monuments located outside the former Soviet Union, since the removal of the surroundings that I've described decontextualizes them not only geographically, but also chronologically. Very few deviations from this rule can be found in, in the Soviet or even the post-Soviet period. If you're interested, I can, I can talk about some of the exceptions that I have found. Um, in textbooks on the history of individual Union republics or autonomous republics within the Russian Federation, war memorials always played a more significant role. Indeed, some of the ways of presenting monuments that would later make it to the Union level were first developed um, in textbooks on Republican or regional history. Textbooks on the history of republics or autonomous regions were much less standardized in the Soviet Union than might have been expected, and the share devoted to the Great Patriotic War could vary considerably, ranging from a mere 1 to 2 percent in Georgia to 24 percent in Turkmenistan of all places. Portraits of local heroes were by far the most frequent type of illustration in the war chapters. Their presentation was often abstracted in ways somewhat reminiscent of drawings of war memorials, such as the trip to a soldier. Frontal views directed the, the um, war heroes' determined gazes at the viewers to be inspired. With monuments, the same effect was achieved via low angles, presenting bronze soldiers as examples to literally look up to. While they were included less systematically than portraits of heroes, such as these, almost 40% of the regional history textbooks in my sample also contained pictures of at least one or two local war monuments. And given the predominance of text over images in textbooks uh, of that period, of the Soviet period, these one to two pictures could constitute up to a third of the total number of illustrations. Right? So every third illustration in the chapter about the war was an image of a monument. Ukraine and Belarus were the first parts of the Soviet Union in which uh, war memorials were included in Republican history textbooks. By 1960, textbooks in these republics 
would typically include one centrally located monument and one showing heroic child martyrs to be emulated. The other republics in which uh, a great patriotic war memorial appeared before union-wide textbooks were Lithuania and Turkmenistan. In the Lithuanian case, the very first secondary school textbook on the republic's history, published in 1958, already included um, it doesn't matter. Uh, already included a, an image of uh, Jozas Mikenas' statue of the local partisan Marite Melnikaite, installed in Zarasei three years earlier. In fact, this is the earliest image of a war memorial that I have found in a school history textbook in the Soviet Union, 1958. In Turkmenistan, uh, the primary school history, history primer, so introductory manual, first published in 1964, featured a bust of Major General Yakub Kuliev. And I don't remember if I have this. Yes, here it is. Um, and more Union and Autonomous Republics followed suit in the later 1960s and 1970s. Unlike the abstracted way in which emblematic monuments such as the Treptow Park Soldier were presented, these local memorials were usually shown in context with uh, their surrounding landscape, or visitors. This style of presentation can already be found in official histories, so not textbooks, but official academic histories, published in the mid-1950s. So the style was well established by the time monuments made it into school textbooks. So the photograph of the 1954 Victory Monument in Minsk that you're seeing here, and which was included in consecutive editions of uh, the Belarusian secondary school textbook, showed the obelisk during a celebration, surrounded by festively clad people with flags. And even where people or flowers were absent from the pictures, war memorials were almost always shown surrounded by vegetation, or at least clouds evoking the monument's specific location. And in this way, uh, textbooks turned the official version of each region's experience during the war into a central feature of its thereby Sovietized identity. At the same time, they visualized a republic's or region's belonging to the family of Soviet nations by showcasing its contribution to the joint war effort. So every republic, every autonomous republic has its own heroes and its own war memorials. More systematically than any other period of history, the Great Patriotic War, and specifically the monuments commemorating it, came to mediate people's, pupils' identification, not only with the entire socialist motherland, but also with their own republic or region. So the mode of presentation of war memorials in Soviet history textbooks produced two different kinds of familiarity. The sociologist Maxime Felder has argued that the term refers to two contradictory relationships, denoting what we know intimately on the one hand, and on the other hand, what we only recognize from having seen before. So monuments outside the Soviet Union, above all the Treptow soldier, were presented in a way that produced familiarity as recognition shown again and again, but usually shorn of local context. Domestic monuments, on the other hand, were typically inscribed into a landscape, treated as mediators and signifiers of local identity. Pupils were also likely to visit them on field trips or even encounter them in their daily lives, producing the familiarity of intimate knowledge that did not require discursive mediation. And this was also encouraged by the relationship between text and picture in the textbooks. In the vast majority of cases, the monuments depicted were not discussed or even referenced in the main body of the text. So text images were separate. So they acted as an additional visual layer, prompting the kind of personal identification that uh, the sociologist Laurent Thévenot has described as a distinctive feature of Soviet and post-Soviet school education. This interpretation is also supported by the way in which the Soviet pedagogical literature instructed teachers to work with war memorials and visual depictions thereof. Uh, a 1976 manual on the teaching of history in year four used the standard drawing of the Treptow soldier, so the one that uh, you can see here, as one of its main examples of the use of visuals in history lessons to encourage pupils to express contents in their own words. While the author of this uh, pedagogical manual cited both good and bad pupil presentations on the picture, 
both, so both the good ones and the bad ones refer to the monument's location only by saying, in Berlin, in a park, there is a monument to a Soviet soldier. That's it. So the question put to pupils asked them only to interpret the sculpture's intentions and did not in any way point to local context. By contrast, guidelines for teaching local history amply referenced monuments as destination for class trips as early as 1954, always exhorting teachers to place them in local context, quote, in placing pupils in front of an object, such as a monument or historic building, one needs to talk about it as it were connecting the narrative with this object, with this territory, end of quote. So I'm now jumping to the post-Soviet period. Um, the early 1990s were the nadir of war commemoration in general. Displays of war memorials became rare in uh, textbooks. The sheer speed of change in historical debates played a role in this, but the decisive factors were spiraling costs and the abrupt crash of the state-funded publishing industry with its colossal print runs. So I'll just leave this here, maybe if you can see the caption. This is an amazing example. We can talk about it in the discussion. Um, following this visual slump of the 1990s, by the early 2000s, textbooks in most post-Soviet countries came to include rich, often color illustrations. The total number of pictures also increased. One Estonian textbook from 2002 has 101 illustrations in the chapter about the Second World War alone. However, it would be an exaggeration to speak of a full pictorial turn in post-Soviet textbooks as a whole, since the overall volume of text has also increased, keeping the number of illustrations per page comparatively low. Even among books published between 2010 and 2019, war-related chapters have less than one illustration per page on average. And those of you who were um, in Vienna for Yuri Slyoskin's talk at the Zeitenwende Festival in uh, September and October um, will, may remember that he also talked about this, that the pictorial turn uh, is maybe less of a turn in the, in the sort of post-Soviet educational context. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union, education systems and textbook markets in the 15 successor states diverged significantly from each other, as did narratives about the history of the Second World War. And nevertheless, a number of similarities remain. One of them concerns the visual components of post-Soviet textbooks. Uh, and one such similarity is that, except for a few cases in the Baltic states, pictures of monuments are never used as objects of critical analysis. Rather, they serve purely illustrative purposes, with the distinction between the monument and what it depicts typically blurred. So no real difference between the war and a monument dedicated to the war but built later. War memorials feature in different ways as illustrations in national level textbooks from one post-Soviet country to another. Um, and this is Turkmenistan. Um, Estonia can serve as an example of radical departure from the Soviet precedent. Um, I have not found a single image of a Soviet war monument anywhere in a post-Soviet Estonian history textbook. At the same time, Estonia is the one country where I have found war memorials being discussed in the pedagogical literature as objects of teaching and critical analysis. Belarus is the other extreme. Even in Soviet times, uh, Belarusian history textbooks depicted more war memorials than those of any other republic. And this tradition continued into the post-Soviet period. By the latter years of Alexander Lukashenko's rule, war memorials came to dominate the visual layer of textbooks throughout pupils' school careers, literally from the age of seven. Um, for example, the 2018 edition of a fourth grade manual titled My Homeland is Belarus includes color photos of nine war memorials, the book itself, in addition to an end sheet map that you can see here of memorable places of Belarus that show several more such memorials. Thus, uh, in Belarus, war memorials are among the main visual tools used to forge Sovietized versions of both national and regional identity, continuing and even expanding on the Soviet visual technique of generating familiarity by associating war memorials with their location and their surrounding landscape. But unlike the late Soviet period, in post-Soviet Belarus, this is done with textbooks that deal with national history. Separate textbooks on regional or local history are absent from the Belarusian school curriculum, and attempts to introduce them have been met with hostility by the regime. Overall, among post-Soviet textbooks in my sample, across countries and including books on international, national, and local history, 
that have illustrated chapters on the Great Patriotic War, just over one in five includes at least one image of a war memorial. And over half of those are Belarusian publications. Uh, and among such textbooks that have illustrated chapters on the Second World War, um, she let me skip this for reasons of time, I'm sorry. I'm looking at my watch. Um, let's skip to regional uh, history. So for regional and uh, local history textbooks, and my sample includes such books from uh, post-Soviet Ukraine and Russia, plus Azeri language textbooks for Karabakh, and Russian language ones for Transnistria. So among regional and local history textbooks, the situation is very diverse. The covers show uh, that textbook publishers vary in how prominent they consider these memorials to be as embodiments of regional identity. Um, but photos or drawings of local Soviet war memorials do feature among the collages or galleries that typically constitute uh, the cover layout of these textbooks. So here's an, an example uh, from 2007 from uh, the Zaporizhia region in Ukraine. Uh, and um, also have examples from Chinyutsi. And in Russian, such monuments have made it onto textbook covers, not only in regions that saw battles in the Second World War, such as Bryansk, but also those far to the east of the front line, such as Boshkortostan, Komi, Penza, you name it. Um, but there are also cases in which covers do not show any monuments at all, or only include post-Soviet monuments not related to the Great Patriotic War. And this corresponds to the varying weight that the Great Patriotic War occupies in regional history textbooks. So chapters that deal with it can take up anything from 1% in Karabakh or in Sakhalin to 29% in Kaliningrad, but also less predictably in the southern Urals. Uh, war memorials are also shown far less systematically in uh, regional history textbooks than in Soviet times. And the relative prominence of war memorials within the chapters also varies. So a uh, 2001 textbook on the history of Tatarstan shows only one such picture among 21 illustrations. In the case of a 2003 book on the history of the Stavropol region, three out of the four illustrations are war memorials. So in some cases, you have an entire chapter about the history of the war, and almost everything that you see visually is a war memorial. Uh, so in Russia, it almost seems as if the situation has been reversed from the Soviet era. While regional textbooks do sometimes feature memorials to the Great Patri Patriotic War, they are routinely presented alongside other symbols of regional identity. In national history textbooks, by contrast, the war has gradually come to crowd out all other visual symbols of history. One standard textbook of 20th and 21st century Russian history, published in 2019, has a cover image, and I love this, because it collates a decontextualized photograph of the Treptow soldier, with a painting of the liberation of Minsk in 1944. So it's a textbook on Russian history, not Soviet, not international, not global. One image is from Berlin and the other is from Minsk. Right? Uh, so two images relating to the Second World War, referencing locations outside of Russia, stand visually for the, the history of Russia in the 20th century. So to conclude, at the outset of my study, I had expected to find war memorials as a central visual element across all Soviet and post-Soviet history textbooks, and one that pupils are taught to experience via a regime of familiarity. And what I've discovered uh, instead is a much more complex picture, suggesting that we need to distinguish between different modes of familiarization, but also di between different ways in which war memorials have been depicted in textbooks on international, national, Republican region, lo local history, not to mention the obvious divergences between post-Soviet countries. I will stop here. I apologize for the somewhat muddled visual elements of the presentation. For those who are interested, I'm happy to share the proofs of my forthcoming article on this. Um, and I'd be very interested in your comments and feedback. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank both our speakers for the very interesting talks and also for not putting me in a bad light, whereas I'm the person keeping the time. You know, it always uh, makes you very unpopular with going after people and, you know, making signs and so on. So, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, now, uh, 
in order to use my slightly privileged position that, you know, I'm not a speaker, but, you know, still I'm sitting here. So I'll just make two comments of my own and then uh, I'll open the floor to you as well. I was listening to your two talks and there, there's one thing I'd like to say about events and it's actually not just a, a question comment but it's also something that I'd like to draw Lucy if she's interested <laughs> because you know Lucy is one of our fellows who gave a very interesting talk a few weeks ago where she also started from the Cathedral of Christ the Savior mm -hmm. and what I found interesting something you mentioned and something that she mentioned was how at the time the discourse was the official discourse that this is a church modeled on Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Now, whoever has been to Hagia Sophia in Istanbul will notice right away that this is completely untrue. You have one dome in Hagia Sophia. Here you have five domes. So it's actually quite a different architectural and art historical type as actually Ivan mentioned. And in this sense, I find this interesting that in a way, you say something, probably knowing that it's not true, but it makes so much sense in the ideology of promoting this sort of link going back to Byzantium and so on. So I wonder if this is something that in your research on, on the cathedral, that this is something that came up because it's so obvious that this church doesn't look like uh, Hagia Sophia. So this is one of the many things that came to my mind when I was listening to you. And you know, Misha, I thought, now I don't know uh, if this text has been in the back of your mind at all, but when I was listening to your talk, I thought of this very famous essay by Walter Benjamin about uh, the mechanical reproduction of works of art. And I thought that your talk in a way opens a very interesting dimension response to that. Because Benjamin's idea is obviously that a work which is mechanically reproduced, so a bit like in a textbook, you see it in a photograph or whatever, loses its aura. So in other words, it uses its sense of presence, holiness, if it's an icon and so on. And I think that in a way, one of the things that can come out of your talk, which is what I see, and this is why my question to you is whether you, you think that this is an interpretation you might agree with, is that when you pay attention to the whole idea of images in textbooks and the whole notion of repetition, obviously a textbook repeats an image over and over again. People who haven't been to the site where this monument was, they recognize it because they keep seeing it over and over again in textbooks, newspapers, and all that. And I think that there's actually something which is very close to, the, uh, to actually Christian theology that repetition creates sanctity. If you see an image over and over again, if you reproduce an icon, the same icon, you don't try to make an original icon, you reproduce the same icon. The more uh, reproductions you have, the more this actually um, intensifies and sort of spreads holiness. And I think that in a way, your example, your, your basically your whole project about textbooks is something that can go into this direction because it is very interesting to see how repetition through mechanical reproduction, quite contrary to what Benjamin says, rather than destroying the, the aura, produces aura. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if this is something that would be interesting uh, for you. So if you want to, we can probably hear one or two uh, people from the audience and then we can have a discussion and you come in. So. Uh, any questions, uh, comments? Yanis, uh, um, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you both for. Uh, uh, thank you both for your uh, excellent presentations. So I have um, a question uh, to Misa, uh, addressed to Misa, and then a, a question for uh, both Ivan and Misa. Um, uh, so the first one uh, with regards to Misa's talk. Mm, I was wondering, uh, because uh, uh, you focused on textbooks, right? So uh, you have to do with schools and uh, students. And uh, I was wondering whether there is um, any evidence on how students 
appropriated uh, these uh, images, right? Uh, because I was thinking uh, back to my school years when you were used to, um, you know, draw silly uh, drawings in these very serious, uh, uh, you know, images of heroes and um, past figures. And um, so, in this way, while I would um, uh, agree with uh, Clemena that um, uh, repetition creates, um, uh, recreates an aura, uh, it also can create uh, boredom. And uh, I would like to, to uh, I guess it's uh, more difficult to have uh, evidence uh, on this respect, but I was just wondering. And then uh, the question that um, I would like to address to both of uh, you, both Ivan and uh, Misa, um, I think that you both uh, presented um, a very compelling analysis on how uh, the regime uses uh, this kind of images and this kind of uh, visual narratives. Um, so, uh, because there is uh, this ongoing discussion on uh, monumentality and different forms of monumentality, um, uh, how could you use uh, your uh, conclusions towards the direction of a more democratic and, and more perhaps critical uh, form of uh, monumentality corresponding to new um, political uh, projects and uh, so yes uh, thank you very much for Yanis thank you very much you see why I started with him because he's one of the young fellows at the institute so you see how when you say when you remember as a school child a lot of us don't remember <laughs> much from the time they were in school so you know listen because in a way your second question connected to mine you, Misha, would you like to say something about that and okay. then Ivan can respond and then we'll move on, yeah? yeah. Thanks, uh, all, all really good questions. So about Benjamin, I think it can work both ways. So um, I would agree with you actually regarding um, the kind of creation of, <coughs> I'm not entirely sure about sanctity, I have to think more about that, but, but certainly certain kinds of, of uh, familiarity that, that yeah, that do give kind of an aura of, of holiness through a constant uh, kind of, I hesitate to say mindless repetition, but a, rep a non-discursive repetition. On the other hand, I do think that there, there are also Benjaminian things at work in, in mechanical reproduction. I have a, an essay forthcoming in social research about the materiality of protest signs, where I argue that, in a sense, the, the increasing ease of access to the means of production of protest signs for example, in the post-Soviet era, um, has uh, kind of desanctified objects that people carry in crowds. Because it used to be that, um, you know, the stjagi of the medieval Eastern Slavic princes, um, they really represented authority and they kind of represented the presence of the divine among the crowd. And there was very limited access, which kind of created a hierarchy in the crowd. Um, and, you know, and then you move on to the victory banner and to kind of medals given out by the state. And then by the 1990s, people can just produce their own signs and they make copies of the victory banner. And now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, we have in, in this project I'm doing with the Ukrainian colleague, we have, a, we have lots of examples of people going in armored vehicles or just regular cars where they have like 10 copies of the victory banner on the same car. So I think it is completely devalued because it no longer carries this kind of aura of sanctity. So I think it can work both ways in, in different contexts. Um, now, evidence, that's a really good question. So um, generally, so we, we um, worked for three years on this, on this um, thematic issue on textbooks, and I, I tried to look at the literature on um, kind of classroom use of textbooks. The problem is that it's extremely difficult to say anything about this. Um, so even people who try to use kind of high-tech methods of eye tracking, et cetera, they have a sample size of 20 high school students from Potsdam, and then they show them pages from textbooks on a screen, which of course is not exactly, the, is not the same thing at all as, as having it as a book. So it's very difficult to say anything non-anecdotal about that. Um, and I have to admit that in, in my work, I have no, um, you know, um, no evidence. The only little bit I found was that, for example, um, I, can, I can prove that a lot of Soviet era textbooks continued to be in use for many, many years into the Soviet post-Soviet period, because we have uh, copies in libraries where, you know, I remember one uh, example from uh, Moldova, 1982, 
where um, at the end, in, on the end sheet, you have the names of the pupils inscribed and the school years, and the list goes on into the mid-1990s, right? So that's all I can say about, about use. However, the other thing that you mentioned, uh, so silly drawings and it creates boredom. So my argument would be that even ironic appropriation still creates familiarity. And Alexei Yurchak wrote about this in his book on the, on the last Soviet generation. Um, so the fact that pupils made fun of images uh, doesn't mean that they didn't have the, the kind of effect that I described here, right? You can, you can think that you're bored by an image for a long time, but still, that is the image that you have seen more than any other image. And then when you get to the place, finally, you know, you might still have this kind of recognition effect, even if it's tinged by irony, etc. cetera. Um, oh, and the critical monumentality. That's really difficult. I mean, you know, my answer, I guess, is really banal. Um, and it kind of echoes what a lot of people say generally about visuals in, in textbooks. As long as they serve a purely sort of decorative or illustrative purpose, so you have text, and then just to make it look nicer, you add in a few images. Um, it's very difficult to, to develop any sort of critical approach. Um, in order to develop a critical approach to visuality, I think you need to teach tools of visual literacy. So enable pupils to distinguish between different types of visual presentation, placement on the page, you know, uh, perspective, think about why an image was produced, by whom, for what purpose, in what context, etc. And that requires, I think, exercises that specifically target kind of, you know, work with visuals, which really is lacking in, in most educational systems in the world. I, I gave a, a version of this talk two days ago near Linz in kind of a, um, you know, a local memorial. Uh, where there were several teachers present, including a history teacher who said, oh, yes, you know, I taught history my entire life, and I completely forgot about visuals. We never really worked with visuals in any meaningful way. And I think that's a very common problem. Yeah. Uh, Ivan, would you like to, to say yeah. something? Oh, yes, uh, of uh, I guess that you also probably have some thoughts about uh, some of the things that Misha well, mentioned. I have no many things to say, but I will start, try to be brief. Um, just maybe one first comment on the Walter Benjamin issue. Um, I think we are forgetting that Benjamin wrote it speaking about art. And in the post-Renaissance myth of art, obviously multiplication means losing the value of the aura. Because it's art which is lost, not the image. And um, going in the same direction, I would say that on the very contrary, the repetition and this has been studied largely by musicologists, is the refrain, right? Refrain which is making us feeling sure. And already Freud in Vienna in 1914 was arguing that repetition is something which is making us feeling super secure. So actually the repetition which is creating the response Misha was speaking about is actually probably part of our brain since a very long time. Uh, now, at the same time, Misha is right that a certain repetition could paralyze, but then I, I will be the, the very old-fashioned art historian. It's because uh, there is a true difference between image and object. And uh, if you repeat certain themes with certain objects which are having certain materiality, mm -hmm. uh, the power is increasing. So, for example, the gilded objects, images, can be amplifying and creating the myth while cheap banners <laughs> are going down. So I believe there is also the issue of materiality which should be yeah, of course, of course. kind of taken into account of this complex picture. And um, so this is in a way also one of the line of what I was saying, trying to say, because what we are assisting in the, uh, let's say, imperialistic discourse over two, two centuries is kind of visual repetition. This monument, these churches are referring to models which are actually supposed to be Byzantine, which they are not at all, but this is not the point. The point is the discourse. But uh, what is funny, uh, when Clemena was speaking about um, uh, the Hagia Sophia, or not the Hagia Sophia, I was trying to figure out how many representations of the true Hagia Sophia were known in Russia in the 20s of the 19th century, and actually almost none. The first big book with images of Hagia Sophia is the Grigor Grigorievich Gagarin of 1856 book, where there is kind of history of Byzantine art and architecture from Ravenna to Moscow. And you have Hagia Sophia in the middle because he was in Constantinople there as a painter. I mean, he was there an official, but he was painting. So just to say that part of the myth is also that I believe to a certain degree, the image was unknown. And then if you think about what a copy is and what a model is, if we follow the pre-modern definition, the important is that you understand 
in, for any possible reason this is a copy. Our idea of copy is the copy of the age of the reproduction. But I mean all the copies of the Holy Sepulchre from 4th century to 17th century are sharing nothing with the Holy Sepulchre. But if you say this is Holy Sepulchre, it's okay. And so the, the last point about, I, I actually follow Misha totally with the analphabetism of images and as a pride, proud art historians, I'm arguing this is the reason why art history is so needed. Because I'm, my research group is, is teaching now an experimental project in a high school. And it's impressive how the kids are really needing to alphabetize with images. So um, the, the use of the image and the critical discourse of it is something which is so needed in a time which is dominated by images as our time definitely is. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I would absolutely follow this idea of alphabetization and if I get well your question, we are also addressing the issue of how do we understand the monumentalization of the uh, of basically everything today? Is it so? Get, uh, they get it well or not? Uh, uh, if I may, uh, uh, that's part of it. That's part of it, yes. But uh, also, uh, since you referred to the materiality of uh, things, and uh, I totally agree, uh, I was wondering what uh, uh, what kinds of monuments would correspond. Our time. So not only our understanding of uh, already existing mo uh, monuments, but how could uh, monuments be designed uh, in different okay. forms? So so I have an answer which is pretty, for me, funny. A few months ago I have seen a documentary movie on an Italian club of football constructed from the down without money. And uh, they started with big provocative hooligans and step by step, they transform this movement of hooligans in a social movement in Florence. And they are actually doing food for people, they are meeting, and now they are constructing their stadium. And this stadium will be without all, will be without any concrete, and will be an open space, which is supposed to be both democratic and gender inclusive. And so I, I, I have still not imagined how the stadium will be looking like, because all stadium we know are the circum, I mean the Roman circus, which is closed. But the, the idea of an open green space <laughs> yeah. is something uh, which is constructing equality and democracy. But I'm afraid that the mood of our days is the very contrary. I mean, we are actually in a moment of history when hate and uh, racism are well uh, are back welcomed, right? Being it on all sides of any walls. But I would be with you with the idea of creating monuments which are open and green. Mm. Yeah, Tatiana, uh, would you like to go first and then uh, Sergey? Thank you both for your fascinating talks. Um, as I was listening, I was reminded of that uh, um, Kamar and Melamed essay, What is to be done with monumental propaganda? And for those who don't know, they make this argument that, you know, um, there are layers of meaning beyond what uh, what is uh, intended, right, by those who constructed the monument, including, you know, um, if you go as a child to Lenin's mausoleum, right, or to as a young adult, uh, there is the meaning that accrues through or in that moment, right, of sexual awakening and so forth. And so their argument is that when you destroy a monument, you destroy those layers of meaning as well, right? Of course, you know this, um, this piece. Um, and my question is, so you presented these two different kinds of intimacy, right? That the intimacy that they're describing, the sort of familiarity of places, and then the kind of faux intimacy of repeated exposure or something along those lines. So, or perhaps I'm mischaracterizing. But anyway, repeated exposure being um, central. So my question is, um, do you see a sort of correspondence to different lines of argument against the destruction of monuments? Uh, in other words, um, do people intimately familiar with monuments object to their destruction in ways that are different from those who uh, who know them in a different way. What are those arguments like? If you could give us a sense of that. Before that, can we go for Sergei's question? Uh -huh. Great. Thank you for um, the talks. I missed the first one, so I'm not quite familiar yet with the genre. But um, I have one general question and then, um, a couple of um, smaller ones. I was struck by your kind of universal rejection and refusal to engage with any Russian philosophy, right? So Misha said it directly, and Ivan presented Stalin as the main philosopher. So I'm puzzled and befuddled, actually. So is it because sort of there is no philosophy available? 
Is it because there are no skills? So in other words, like sort of, what does this repression of the philosophical discourse tell us about philosophy, but about also about you? And um, <laughs> right. And the second question or set of questions is for Misha. Um, I mean, I'm sort of familiar with some of parts of your project on, on this, uh, right? But uh, you didn't quite explain. Maybe I missed it. Um, so why war memorials and textbooks as opposed to, I don't know, Pushkin statues or something else, right? So would the dynamic be different at all or not? Like sort of like why privilege a very particular set of uh, monuments and, and stuff? Um, and the second one, um, we kind of we didn't discuss it, but um, I'm spending way more time with children's literature than I should, like in the last like several years. But um, I, I learned a lot. But um, what we are not discussing at all is the didactic aspect of textbooks, right? And if you read the um, kind of the, the critical lit on, um, on children's books, they all emphasize the repetition as the main device. And it, it's not surprising. Think of, I don't know, Kalabok. The same story is told like, I don't know, three times, right? And then so on and so forth. The point there, there uh, of this repetition is to get the student or the, pure, the kid uh, familiar with the internal structure of the narrative, right? So through through the repetition, you expose the device, right? And in that sense, I think uh, Benjamin is less helpful than, say, Levi Strauss, right? And uh, he has a quite a good book on um, masks, right? Where he shows, like, what is happening with the masks, like if you take certain masks of a particular uh, clan or tribe. So you get the repetition with a difference, a repetition with a difference. And the repetition, again, highlights the overall semiotic kind of entity, right, to which all these masks belong. Difference emphasizes kind of a certain distinction, right? So it's the same, but not quite, the same, but not quite. So in that sense, sort of like it's less about aura, but more about highlighting the belonging, right? So, so going back to the question, right? So what are the, did, did you look at all the didactic aspects of, us, of this imagery? Because like the two elements, the two readings of the monuments that you described, to me, make perfect sense, right? So if I am a, well, like the contextualist and decontextualized, right? If I am a pedagogue, of course, you're developing the metonymic and metaphoric skills. Decontextualized and pushes you to uh, interpret it metaphorically, sort of bring different codes and so on and so forth. Contextualize, yeah, make the connection, link, sort of create this kind of metonymic sort of, um, uh, uh, association. So in that sense, like, yeah, m monuments would be sort of perfect places to ex uh, exercise those skills. So in other words, like, do, do you plan to go in this direction or not? Yeah. Can I, can I just say something here? Because I feel that one of uh, Sergei's questions also includes me in some way. I mean, uh, why did I think of including visual thought in a lecture series on Russian, uh, Russian philosophy, right? So, no, and the exclusion of philosophy. You, well, that's, that's the point. So uh, the thing is that one of the things I wanted to do was basically to show that uh, philosophy in the Russian context means something quite different from philosophy in the Western context. You know, when we speak of uh, philosophy in the Western context, you think of Kant and Hegel and Heidegger and sort of people like that. And I think that when you speak about philosophy in the Russian context, you generally, it, it, it's in a way wrong probably to translate as philosophy in English. Rather, that's why so many of the textbooks are called Russian thought, Russian philosophy as Russian thought. And I think that the way I see the whole lecture series is basically to look at religious thought, political thought, visual thought, and so on. So philosophy is something which I try to understand in this sort of Russian sense of the word. But I think it's a very good point because I also <coughs> realized that some other people reacted like that. <coughs> Where is the philosophy here? So I thought because we'll be preparing uh, with George Pattison uh, an edited volume of uh, the papers that are presented and we decided that we'll call it religious thought, not philosophy, because you always <coughs> need to explain these things because people have a certain expectation, which is very natural. But Please, you go ahead. I think these questions were mainly towards Misha, right? Uh, well, I guess the, the, the philosophy question also goes Yeah, I, I was included also in philosophy, but me, yeah, Misha, please yeah. go ahead and again. Okay, so, so let me start with uh, Tatiana's question. So, yes, I do think that you can very, very clearly see these different approaches in debates surrounding monuments, especially in Ukraine right now, where usually there is a small number of very vociferous activists who object to a monument on general grounds because the monument violates some general principle, 
right? It stands for something that's contrary to uh, national identity, that symbolizes colonialism, etc., etc. And um, the opponents of monument destruction or removal, who are also a small minority, I mean, the vast majority of people don't, don't care, but the opponents uh, usually uh, don't talk so much about the general principle and much more about the intimate connection. So, you know, this, is, this was the place of my first kiss. I walked past the statue every day on my way to school. There's a wonderful film from, um, I think, 2015, a documentary film about the linen fall, where uh, you see uh, an, an old man who's watching the toppling of a Lenin statue, and he's trying to express his emotions but all he can say are just a few words, like, I remember when my mother, and then he stops, and then he starts crying. So he can't even articulate the strong emotional connection that he feels. Um, in, in the project that, in this book I'm writing with uh, Mikola Homanyuk, we're collecting lots of different examples. And just um, yesterday, I think, he sent me an example he found from the um, uh, Transcarpathian region, where um, there was once again a movement to uh, topple a statue to Soviet liberator soldiers, as they're called officially, and the local residents uh, unanimously kind of voted against it because they said this is not an abstract generic statue, this is a statue to specific people from our place. And very often it's like that. There was another one in Mykolaiv uh, where there was a, a statue to a um, policeman who died in the, in the line of duty, and there were some activists against it because it was from the Soviet period. So they said it also stands for the Cheka and for, you know, everybody was part of the Soviet police. And others said, uh, no, this was a monument uh, built on a grassroots initiative in the 1970s when people collected money to have it built. And it stands not for, you know, abstract Soviet police or secret police. It stands for specific people who are mentioned there, right? So there's always, like in every single conflict where there actually is a conflict, you know, sometimes it, it is unanimous, we just want to get rid of it. But where there is an actual conflict, usually those uh, voting to preserve the monument always have some sort of connection that's more than just an abstract principle. Um, and I actually wrote uh, an essay came out on Eurozine a few weeks ago uh, specifically about that. Um, so, Russian philosophy. I mean, you know, my response is what you call no skills, basically, um, because my engagement with, with Russian philosophy dates back to my early 20s, and since then I haven't read anything systematically, except for a few books by Klemena. Um, but, I mean, you know, honestly, I was invited, you know, I've been working on this stuff for three years, on this project. Um, Klemena said, well, why don't you talk about this in this context? And I said, okay, it's not really my context, but why not? So, I'm not trying in any way to belittle the contributions of Russian philosophy, it's just not the perspective that I'm coming from. Uh, why war memorials? Because once again, that's where I came from. So I didn't come from textbook research. I came from um, the study of war memorials and people's interaction with them. And more, the more I worked on this, the more I realized the importance of the kind of educational pedagogical context. And then I got a one-month fellowship in, in, in uh, Braunschweig to start working on this stuff. And I was so fascinated that I just continued. Um, but I think that it would be much more difficult to do this kind of thing with Pushkin statues, for example, because they are much less systematically present. So war memorials, I mean, there is not a single region uh, or even sub-region in the Soviet Union, I think, after 1945, where you don't find any war memorials. They're always present in some way or another. Um, now, you also always find statues of great men in general. You know, it could be local poets. Like, I think I had this, this um, example from uh, Chichen and Gushetia, right, from the, the 1970s, um, where I think it's Kitagurov. Um, so you always have kind of a Pushkin style figure, but it's not always specifically Pushkin. So I think it would be more difficult to do um, an analysis with this kind of sample size on, on a Pushkin, even if that was my topic, but it's not. Uh, and um, yeah, children's, I mean, repetition, you know, in, in our introduction to the volume, I cite your, your book on, on children's literature in the historical part. Um, to the extent that I looked at the pedagogical literature, I was interested, so I did look at some books that uh, try to talk about using visuals in, ed in history education, not education in general, history education specifically. Um, there was even one book which was all about using um, chalk drawings, an entire book devoted to chalk drawings in history education. Um, but there was relatively little uh, kind of, you know, 
in terms of a general theoretical approach. And, you know, I cited, I mean, I have more in the paper itself, but I cited the main things that I found uh, where people talk about how to use monuments, which usually revolve around specific examples, because very often these books were, I mean, as uh, probably you know, even though your, your period is a bit earlier, I think the one that you mostly worked on, um, it was mostly like conferences of teachers where at least you know the, the ones that i saw 60s 70s 80s where you know teachers from different kind of model schools or very active teachers come together and talk about their practice and then you know some of them try to generalize it uh, but most don't so i had to work with the kinds of examples that i found and what i found interesting is that you know you find the contextualization in um literature or uh, narratives about teaching local history and you find the abstraction in narratives about sort of teaching images in general. Mm. Um, I think ah, that's, sure. yeah. that's it. Thanks. Ivan, can you say now, answer the difficult question, <laughs> what happens with Russian religious, uh, with Russian philosophy? Um, well, I, I would answer the same thing with Misha answered. It's not my field of expertise. I'm an art historian uh, dealing with visual culture and um, actually also, I was at the beginning thinking we'll have a bit more time when you should squeeze it in 25 minutes, which we actually learned exactly two days ago, yes. right? Um, I wanted just to show the visual part of the story, but obviously each of the steps I was presenting has an intellectual and now how to define it, philosophical background or not, but um, in terms of political um, philosophy, let's call it like that. I believe Uvarov would be a very interesting figure to introduce and to discuss its impact on Nicholas I constructions, obviously. And um, interestingly enough, Stalin was p maybe not the bad, question, bad person to discuss national policy <laughs> and linguistic issues and determination of what is and what should be representing the identity of a place. He, he was theoretically working on it. And as, as for the, obviously, Putin's and Lushkov time will be a very complex issue. So I, I, I actually not have all tools to do it in a proper way. But um, in an ideal scenario, which is a book I'm writing right now on this question, I will certainly give more place. But I would probably agree with Clemena, not exactly in the philosophy, in the Kant or, uh, or Hegel sense of the term, but more a kind of political, theoretical reflection on what is making uh, people appear. 